Welcome to Citizens for Community Media. I'm here in South Bend, <coughs> Notre Dame community. And the title here is, Did Pope Benedict Change uh, Evolution or Creation with Evolution? Did he, did he, was he the most influential in putting the Catholic Church on the path of teaching evolution instead of creation. Um, I got my dad's old uh, textbook from Notre Dame. I had many uncles and my dad went there. He, he started in 39. His brother finished in 39. And they both were uh, Navy pilots, ROTC, and his brother um, <clears throat> there's a big book on Notre Dame. First, on the first page, it mentions my dad's brother. And on the last page, it mentions my dad's brother. And they considered him, some people, I guess, uh, he was the first casualty of World War II. He had finished his training, maybe had an hour or two left, and uh, down there by Miami. <clears throat> and he was the gunner. That day, and the other guy was the pilot, and the pilot crashed a month before Pearl Harbor. But um, my dad's brother used to go to Newt Rockney camps as a teenager. And his mom was Irish. His grandfather was from Norway. So, you, so it was a perfect mix. So, that's what, so he ended up going to Notre Dame. <clears throat> my dad followed. And... Um, Notre Dame, from what I know, only had like two and a half thousand students during the war. And the story is that the Navy came in, Notre Dame was going down financially, and the Navy came in and upheld them. So you have a convergence of Notre Dame with Navy, with um, the government, let's say. And uh, that could be problematic. But my dad's textbook, um, <clears throat> there's apologetics on here. It, said he, it says Father O'Brien, but the, uh, the, the person who wrote this textbook uh, apparently was Reverend Cornelius Haggerty, CSC, A Course of Apologetics. Now, one of the chapters, chapter 6, is called Creationism or Evolutionism. Now, I could say, did Pope Benedict uh, replace creationism with evolutionism? I just call it creation. Um, with evolution. Now, here he goes into how communism uh, was the foundation of communism was uh, evolution. But you can see the beginnings here that it was assumed the world was old. Um, 1940, my other uncle went to Notre Dame after the war. He would fund dinosaur hunts, so he totally believed in evolution. I'm named after this uncle, so I was raised around the belief of evolution. So by the time I went to Notre Dame, Father Murphy, well, I didn't want the class, but I was, they said I had to take it for a whole year, geology, and it was pure evolution. I don't believe it was even theistic evolution. So by the time I went there, evolution was a straight fact. Even to the point that I knew of a student uh, in our prayer group who told me he was taking for his pre-med, evolution in each class was the primary subject that was being taught as a fact. And I know teachers very high up that told me that as far as they're concerned, the official teaching at Notre Dame is theistic evolution. So Notre Dame has come that way. Um, but unless you know the history of it, you, uh, you're not going to see the full picture. So what's the history of it from my point of view? Uh, Darwin's book, Origin of Species, was written in 1859. That was a shock to the world. At Notre Dame, buried at the Basilica, is the famous Orestes Bronson. 
And I read that Lord Acton in Europe said that the two greatest thinkers America had in the 19th century were Orestes Bronson and Jean Calhoun. That's Clemson University. Um, Bronson was very, very much against evolution when it, when it hit the scene, and he wrote a lot blasting it. It was very dangerous, and the church should not accept it at all. One of his pupils was Father Zahm. And it turned, just turned out that Zahm completely betrayed his teacher, Orestes Bronson, and flipped over to a radical evolutionary position. And Zahm is considered by some as the greatest intellectual to come out of Notre Dame. So Zahm was very instrumental in slipping in theistic evolution into Notre Dame. Um, now, what caused me to bring this subject up again, I've talked about it a lot, is I happened to see this article um, called The Solemn Enthronement of Evolution by Philip Campbell. He's part of this group called Unam Sanctum Catholicum. Um, Apparently, he wrote it uh, May 9, 2014. It became available online 2022. But let me read the first paragraph of this article, give you an idea why I called the show what I did. It's called The Solemn Enthronement of Evolution. While it is established point of our faith, well, it is an established point of our faith that the church cannot change teachings that have been definitively proposed for belief. The about face the Catholic Church has done on the question of evolution since the mid-19th century is nothing short of revolutionary. Revolutionary in the most literal sense of the word, to turn around. For the Church has done just that. Turned around on its approach to evolution and questions surrounding the origin of human life. In this article, we will trace the origins of the Church's interaction with evolutionary theology and witness how while the papacy of the 19th century condemned evolution as incompatible with Christian theology, the late 20th century magisterium has essentially enthroned the theory as a permanent fixture of Catholic thought. The two most influential theologians behind this enthronement were none other than Teilhard de Chardin and Joseph Ratzinger, who then became Pope Benedict XVI. Now, um, the mid-19th century is when evolution hit the scene. Now, I'm going to propose the, the theory, I guess you'd call it, that what really helped promote the acceptance of evolution was the I mean, this, maybe this is a far stretch for some, but what was going on in 1859 and in 1860-61, as far as we're concerned? The American Civil War. And the American Civil War was the other world, okay? You had the world in Europe, and then the main world, the other world, what that was happening was the United States, and the Civil War was huge. Karl Marx followed it closely, wrote on it extensively. And one reason Karl Marx wrote on it is that the revolutionaries of 1848, which were basically closely aligned with the beliefs of Karl Marx, uh, lost all their little attempts of revolution in Europe, and millions of them came over to America, and many aligned their revolutionary cause there, they saw the same revolutionary cause being fought by the North, whom the Southerners called atheist and communist. Lincoln tried to get Garibaldi to be his main general, because the, the North was losing because they had bad generals. They had, they had ten times of everything else, but they had bad generals compared to the South. He tried to get Garibaldi. Well, Garibaldi was busy with Massini in Italy trying to overthrow the Pope, 
which had his own huge papal state. Well, Garibaldi and Massini succeeded and reduced a huge papal state to what it is now, which is a couple of square miles or whatever it is. Garibaldi told Lincoln, this is from my research, that he would be his general, but uh, it's got to be for the cause of slavery, get rid of slavery. And Lincoln had not come up with the Emancipation Proclamation yet. So Garibaldi said no. So slavery was the fundamental issue because the communist and the atheist especially hated the institution of slavery. Now, there's two things that are that is most shocking or has been most shocking to the to many of the Catholic minds. One that recently is the idea of a young earth and six day creationist. Those are wacko fundamentalist. Nobody wants them at the table. They're not allowed at the table at Notre Dame. They're wackos. But the other thing that maybe is even more shocking um, goes back to the, to the slavery thing. The, the, the Pope Pius IX was the Pope at the time of the American Civil War. He corresponded with uh, Jefferson Davis. And apparently they had a good history and a good friendship. And um, Notre Dame betrayed that because the commencement speaker at Notre Dame in 1865 was William Tecumseh Sherman. So they, so they kind of betrayed that. Um, so as shocking as having a six-day creationist at the table at Notre Dame, even more shocking is to have the belief that the slave-master relationship is not a sinful relationship, that slavery is not sin. And there's an article here on Cardinal Avery Dulles on slavery, and here's a quote out of it. This guy is commenting on Avery Dulles' article in um, Crisis Magazine, I think, 2005. Dulles was refuting a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court, a guy named Newman, Noonan, who argued that the church has changed its teachings, and has especially changed its teachings on slavery. So this guy writes, um, the article is very cleverly argued, talking about Dulles's, Cardinal Dulles' um, article, but its conclusion is all the more shocking. Cardinal Dulles maintains that the church still teaches, as it did in 1866, that slavery is compatible with natural and divine law. Slavery is undesirable, undesirable, but like poverty and war, we cannot realistically expect its complete disappearance until the es eschaton, the end when Christ comes back. Hence, while the church condemns slave trading, it does not brand slavery as such as intrinsically immoral. This echoes the position of American Catholic theologians in the 19th century. So Dulles is a cardinal, and his job is to defend the faith par excellence and there's nothing in the scriptures that condemns the master-slave relationship. And the condemnation of the master-slave relationship could come close to what St. Paul said, that if you teach in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, if you teach that you can't get married, you can't engage in the husband-wife relationship. You can't enter into that relationship. Which many were teaching, actually. Let me read it. Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, doctrines of demons, forbidding to marry, forbidding to enter into the husband-wife relationship. Well, how about forbidding anybody to enter into a slave-master relationship? Of course, 
That's what the Civil War was about. It's a sin. Cardinal Dallas is saying, no, the church has never taught that it was a sin. Just like the church has never taught, because St. Paul says it right here, never taught that you can't enter into the husband-wife relationship. Now, if the husband disobeys God, his, his duties, and the wife disobeys God in her duties, then you could say that that relationship has become sinful. But the idea is not wrong. Now, if the master doesn't do his duty in that position and the slave doesn't do his duty, then that relationship becomes sinful. But to say that the slave-master relationship is sinful, you're getting very close on a parallel to doctrines of demons. Because you're calling something a sin, which the Bible does not call a sin. And that was what Paul, why he wrote that. It is not a sin to enter into the husband-wife relationship. Even though Paul made it clear, he'd rather have everybody single living for, straight up for God. Because if you get married, now you're double-minded. Now you have to please your wife and the world. And Paul didn't like it. But he says if you can't contain, it's better to marry than to burn. So, Dulles stood for the historical church. But, if you ask most all Catholics around the world today, do you believe that slavery is sinful? They're going to go, of course. Um, I suppose there should be another follow-up question to that. But f since Vatican II, which was... 1965 and 1967, Notre Dame came out from under the Catholic Church and went independent. Now, it has the name, the reputation of being Catholic, but it was only officially Catholic until 1967. Then it had to conform its teachings to uh, the Vatican. But one thing, and I've given this story before. So, since my uncles and I had sisters and cousins that went to St. Mary's, my uncles went to Notre Dame, uh, it was a given that I was going to go to Notre Dame. Okay, so I was able to get in early because I was, you know, I got in early. Uh, so, in the fall and then the spring, I had a chance to visit. And then I went to visit Notre Dame with a friend, and uh, I discovered 48 out of the 50 people that I interviewed, so to speak, said they hated it at Notre Dame. So when I came back home, I said, Dad, I don't want to go to Notre Dame. No way. I don't want to go. Uh-uh. If they hate it that much, uh, something's wrong here. Well, the tradition was so strong, and my uncle, basically they said I had to go, and I couldn't fight it. Now, one thing that I do remember, my sister was at St. Mary's, and she had all these boys. There was no girls at Notre Dame, so she hung out with all these guys. They were, she hung out with the smartest ones, and they were into being big thinkers. Don't forget, this is revolutionary times. People are like philosophizing. They're, being, they're like trying to get the big picture. What is the big picture here? But these guys still said that they had a famous phrase they kept saying. I was with them for three days. Um, we're effed up. We don't know why we're effed up. And anybody that comes here does get effed up. Those, that was, I mean, I'm not saying the whole word, but that's, that's how they talked back then. Um, I believe it's because what happened to me my freshman year. So I'm visiting in, um, in the spring of my senior year in high school. I go there my freshman year, kaboom. Father Murphy, three days a week, I came from a monkey. Then a class I didn't want, they gave it to me. They said I had to take it. Psychology, and it was B.F. Skinner. Pure atheist uh, psychiatrist, psychologist. There is no God behind behaviorism. 
the evolution I was being given didn't even bring in God to it. So it's, it's all leading to a type of atheism, which then down the road I had a teacher that was an atheist. Um, to give you an example of the, of the, the conflict, and don't forget, I was forewarned. You're going to get messed up if you go to Notre Dame. So I'm kind of like, okay, what's the problem? Well, I don't think anybody saw that that was the problem. Nobody thought they were being lied to on the science. They believed it. We believed what, what the priests were teaching us about evolution, that we evolved over 14 billion years ago, and the earth was created 4 billion years ago, and then we evolved through millions of years from the monkey. No one questioned it then it's putting into actual practice with B.F. Skinner. Psychiatry. Since we did evolve from the monkey, psychiatry has its own field. We didn't know that that's where the problem was. We thought that was true. So when you're deceived to think that that's true, and to show you how much people believed it, the senior class in 1971 they had a, a Patriot Club or something, they changed the name, but they would vote every year who they thought was the greatest American. In 1971, the second runner-up, the person who came in second, was B.F. Skinner, who uh, my dad remarried after my mom died, and the lady he remarried happened to have B.F. Skinner as her teacher at the University of Minnesota. And she happened to be a very beautiful lady. And she said he was a sex pervert, couldn't stand him, because obviously she was pleasant to look at. So this is what was happening at this time, that Notre Dame had come out, out from under the Vatican, and now it's on its own, in 67, and after Vatican II, evolution really rushed in. It was already kind of there, but like in my dad's textbooks, yeah, communism was basically founded on evolution. Yeah, it's pretty problematic. But the, the, one of the reasons that evolution got really hold of, and I'm arguing this, is that the issue of the slave-master relationship, which is which the Civil War was fought over primarily, yeah, it was states' rights on one hand, but on another hand, um, really, the churches split over the slavery issue. And after they split over the slavery issues in the late 1840s, Calhoun, Clay, and Webster, the three greatest statesmen, says, I don't see any hope for the, for the Union. Once the churches have split, there's nothing to hold it together. So there was going to be a split. And that, the, the, the greatest uh, theologian was in the North, in the North, I believe, was John Henry Hopkins. And he said the, the church's teaching on the master slave relationship is its strongest doctrine. There's no stronger doctrine. There's, not, there's more scripture. That position that was never challenged throughout the history of the church, in effect, never challenged. The first time it was ever challenged was the American Civil War. So now what we're seeing here is the greatest, strongest Christian doctrine that, that has held, the, held the, the firmest was overthrown. Well, that means every lesser doctrine doesn't have a chance. If the strongest doctrine is taken out, once David took out Goliath, they fled. Once the strongest doctrine was taken out, the other doctrines don't have a chance. So. The master-slave relationship was demonized. Basically, that doctrine's of the devil, where the scripture might actually say, no, their doctrine's of the devil. So you've got, you got a civil war here. The hero in the North was John Brown, a total terrorist. That's their hero. The South said, you know, he's like a demon. He's got to be demon-possessed. So you've got, you got a massive civil war here. But the next war that took place after that, because the war settled it. You gotta understand wars. If the Muslims attack a Christian nation and they win, how long does that nation stay Christian once the Muslims win? 
It doesn't. The Muslims take over. Their beliefs take over. Once the North, and if the South was right, they're atheists and communists, once the North won, nothing can compete with their, new, their ideology. It's not going to stand. So the North ran that the master-slave relationship was wicked to the core. The whole idea was wicked. That position stays with us. It's not going to be overcome. And with that came the communist belief in evolution, which was at the core. We eventually became at the core of Marxism. The popes basically have always said that. It's in, it's in uh, my dad's textbook here. So what goes along with the American empire, created by Lincoln, is the belief in evolution. And eventually, it's a little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. And it will get into everything. And once Notre Dame merged with the Navy, World War II, our government, is, its default position, of course, is evolution. So Notre Dame is going to go that way big time. Now, the people said that you're going to get messed up here if you go to Notre Dame. They had no reason to believe they were being lied to. This is science. And what, and what did we read? Oppositions of science falsely so-called. I don't know if I read it or not. Um, Paul writes, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And then you have Peter kind of repeating the, the whole idea here. What's Peter say? He says, um, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their, their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And then he says at the end, St. Paul, in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Well, evolution's at the core of this. My sister's friends were getting messed up because they were taught evolution. And I didn't know that was the problem. So, after my senior year, I mean, after my, not high school, after my freshman year at Notre Dame, then in the summer, I happened, my, I, I took a philosophy class in the summer from my own home, University of Wisconsin, with my mom. Teacher was lived right next to us. He was there for the summer. He was from Oxford in England, getting his PhD. And it was a philosophy class, and he taught, and he was considered the smartest guy to come from our area, Wisconsin Dells, Hans Oberdick. And he taught the class. My mom's in it with all her friends. I'm like, like one of the unusual ones. And he said, he explained why he, he was, there is no God. There is no God. Now me, in my st stupidity, I walk out of that because he had everybody believe me. Only one lady objected to him saying there was no God. Basically, everybody's going along with him because he's so smart, high IQ. And I walk out of the class and just in total freedom, without thinking, I go, yeah, when you really think about it, and I'm thinking pure evolution, I'm thinking B.F. Skinner, all true. Why would I think it's not true? I go, when you really think about it, I guess there is no God. Well, <laughs> that put me off on a path to destruction. But I went so fast on that path that, boom, I said, hold it here. This is crazy. And then I dropped out of Notre Dame. 
started reading the Bible and came back three years later, knowing what I believed, because I had never read the Bible. And I was able to navigate. And I first thing I did after I dropped out was started reading creationist. Henry Morris, John Whitcomb, all these guys, because I knew that was the issue. And then I find this article, which explains a lot. And let me see if I can breeze through here this last 30 minutes. Explaining, no, I know, I mean, I knew most of this, almost, well, I mean, basically I knew after I dropped out of Notre Dame and started reading Christian literature and reading the Bible, I already knew this, I just didn't know the terms. I didn't know that the word heresy wasn't in my head or, um, but I knew the church totally was taken over by evolution at Notre Dame and then everywhere I went, I saw they were all teaching evolution, theistic evolution. But in the minds of anybody receiving it, you have no access to a literal, real Adam and Eve. You don't have any access to original sin if you're holding on to evolution. And that's why my sister's friends were messed up. They didn't have access to any faith. Evolution wouldn't allow them honestly to go there. And give me an example. Went overseas, studied in Innsbruck. My sophomore year, my mom and dad came to visit, and it just so happened when they came to visit, we're picking our classes for the second semester. So I said, well, Mom, I don't know which class. I said, come to my class with me. I'm just signed to see if I want to take this class or that. Well, one was a theology class. And the, he's teaching creationism and then evolution side by side. And I'm going, my head's splitting open. I'm going, hold it here. This is so obviously something is wrong. You cannot be claiming you're teaching creationism and then you're teaching evolutionism at the same time. Which one is it? And in fact, just got back from having dinner a couple days ago at the Hacienda and they're, they're, we're talking to the waitress. I just felt like asking her, well, where, where did you go to high school? Because she seemed like she was right out of high school. Well, she said Marion High School. I said, well, I said, what did they teach on evolution? And she goes, you know, and I said, evolution and creation. She said, that was one thing I really wanted to know. I kind of really wanted to know where I came from and all that. And he said, she said, they, they froze up. They wouldn't talk about either. They wouldn't, they wouldn't say if they believed in creationism or if they believed in evolution. It's like they're afraid. I mean, she said that. She said they were like afraid to, to, to know which one. Well, yeah, which one is it? Choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. They don't know how to answer anymore. So, um, quickly going through here, here's the article. Uh, in 1899, the index, the index, which was books that are forbidden or not forbidden. So basically, when my dad was there, he had a huge book, list of books he could not read at Notre Dame. And basically, when I got to Notre Dame, it was the forbidden, forbidden books that we were reading. It was that big of a revolution. The index sought to impose censure on Father John Zahm, an American layman and professor at Notre Dame who had argued along the same lines as Father Caverny, Zahm's book, Evolution and Dogma. Leo XIII, however, intervened to stop the publication of the condemnation, fearing that it would be construed as a condemnation of evolution as such when the actual points of contention were much narrower. Further confusion was added to the Zahm case by its overlap with the Americanist controversy. So, Americanism, Americanism was a heresy. Zahn was at the, was kind of like the leader of the Americanist movement. And of course, this article is going to point out that the Americanism and modernism, the core doctrine was evolution. Um, part two here is evolution as the central tenet of modernism. Now, a lot of this comes from Pope Pius X. He wrote an encyclical in 1907 called Pasendi. Um, from 1900 on, however, the matter of evolution took on new importance in the church as it was adopted by the modernists and became the central tenet of their thought. 
Indeed, from 1900 on, evolution and modernism would be inextricably bound. Sam wrote his, uh, he was condemned in 1899, and he promised to publicly renounce it. Well, guess what? He never did publicly renounce it. And those ideas that Zahm had stayed strong at Notre Dame. Church had condemned it. He said, "There's like Bronson, you can't mix the two. Evolution and creation can't be mixed. Zahm says, yes, you can. He said, I got Aquinas behind me. I got Augustine behind me. They believed in theistic evolution. They were appalled that he wrote it. He didn't publicly renounce it. He got around that, and uh, it stayed at Notre Dame. Um, this, this part here is the synthesis of all heresies. That's in uh, Pasendi, the encyclical. It is difficult to pinpoint the beginning of the modernist crisis, but it, it, but it is no exaggeration to say that it began in earnest when Catholic theologians began attempting to apply evolutionary concepts to the Church's understanding of herself. Modernism, according to the famous definition of St. Pius X in Pasendi, is the synthesis of all heresies. But the reason modernism is the synthesis of all heresies is not because it professes all heresies formally, but because of its incorporation of the principle of evolution as applied to truth. Once the evolution of dogma is admitted, it writes here, every heresy, every heresy is present in potency. Um, in Pasendi, uh, Pope Pius X writes, um, Thus the way is open to the intrinsic evolution of dogma. Here we have an immense structure of sophisms which ruin and wreck all religion. This author here is saying that, the Pope is saying, evolution, once it plays out, will wreck all religions. Um, <clears throat> Evolution thus becomes the one reality which explains both the material and spiritual trajectory of mankind. We will see this think and refine later in the teachings of Teilhard de Chardin. It is for this reason that Pope Pius X <coughs> says that evolution is the principal doctrine of modernism. And Pope Pius X writes in Pasendi, 1907. First of all, the modernists lay down the general principle that in a living religion, everything is subject to change. It must, in fact, be changed. In this way, they pass to what is practically their principal doctrine, namely evolution, to the laws of evolution, everything is subject. Okay. So I remember being in that class with my mom, and I was so mad at, at a friend. John Lampy was, his, was my friend, because in my mind, He's believing two opposites. He's not being honest. He's just, you know, I guess they just want to get, up, get through Notre Dame and get a job. And they say, hold it here. The world has to stop at this point. We have to decide, is it evolution or creationism? And I'm saying, I'm willing to stop it right now. I could care less. Forget about Notre Dame degree. Forget about that. This needs to be solved. Well, nobody wanted to solve it. They just carry on. You know, if your desire is to be a priest or a minister and there's a conflict, well, put it off to the side because you don't want that conflict to stop you from becoming a priest. Or you want this job. Well, is the job more important than resolving and then, than the truth? Well, in most, most cases it is. So he says here, in this way they pass to what is practically their principal doctrine, namely evolution. This is what Pope Pius X in 1907. Evolution, this author writes here, entered the church as part of a very particular academic dispute over the reconciliation of science with Genesis under the, um, under the hand of the modernists. It became the central principle of dissent against the Catholic Church, in the name of which every innovation was justified. But America was so powerful, and America because the Northerners, Garibaldis, the Marxists, the atheists, the communists, as the South called them, totally condemned slavery, the strongest doctrine. So now, the church can't even defend creationism, which you would think 
is a super strong doctrine. The Apostle Creed starts out, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. Ten Commandments. God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Therefore, you work six days and you rest on the seventh. You can't get more fundamental. How could it be overthrown? It was overthrown. The slave-master relationship was overthrown. The six, God created the world in six days to rest Overthrown. Well, how could the leaders of the church allow that to be overthrown? The political forces are too powerful. When the Muslims conquer the country, the Muslims take over. And when the North beat the South, the Bible was thrown away and the doctrines of the North took hold. And who were they? They were Marxist revolutionaries from 1848. That's why I had the show on Lincoln. When he ran, people said he was, he just basically said he's an atheist. That's what they called him. Pius X was partially successful in his, this endeavor, but the seduction of modernism was strong. From the 1930s until the eve of Vatican II, we will see a rehabilitation of modernism and the solemn enthronement of the chief tenet of modernism, evolution, in the thought of the Catholic Church. Part three, enter Pierre de, de Teilhard de Chardin. Um, real quick, what did de Chardin teach? Now, I remember de Chardin when I was in high school. The, our, the doctor that lived right near us took the priest's place one time. I'd never seen it before. You know, in the Dells. He, he gave the sermon. I must have been in high school. And what was his sermon on? Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. It's like, wow. The church said he was a heretic. Okay, that's the whole point. The church always said he was a heretic. But that changed around Vatican II. A new spiritual atmosphere has been created by the appearance of the idea of evolution, which has transfigured everything. This is Deschardins. From here on out, the idea of evolution is the central pivot upon which every other concept of Teilhard's thought rotates. It is the definitive truth about reality. And this guy writes, this is not an exaggeration. Teilhard's thought taught that the evolution of the cosmos, the biological evolution of creatures, and the intellectual and spiritual development of man are all part of a single evolutionary movement of the cosmos, from inanimate matter toward conscious spirit. Jumping ahead here, the evolutionary arc terminates at a place called the Omega Point, the Omega Point, the terminus and goal of history, which can best be explained as the total possible integration of human consciousness and material complexity in such a way that the universe itself attains a collective consciousness. This is identified with Christ, who draws all things to himself. Thus, the cosmic Christ is the focus of the omega point. Teilhard's rehabilitation was advanced vigorously during the 1960s by two eminent theologians. The first was Cardinal Henry de Lubac fellow Jesuit and student of Teilhard who wrote The Religion of Teilhard de Chardin, defending the teachings of Teilhard as completely orthodox and accusing those who had condemned him of doing so out of ignorance. Well, he was <laughs> considered a heretic. All of a sudden, he's not. The second of Teilhard's great defenders was Father Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict, whose 1968 book, Introduction to Christianity, he praised upon the bizarre Christology of Teilhard. Now, the textbook I had Theology textbook was out of Yale University in 1969. This, this is when things are happening in the late 60s. You're talking revolution is hitting. And all good revolutions, all real revolutions, are at the theological level, period. The American Revolution, 1776, it's a theological war. The, Amer the American Civil War was theological. And in the 60s, the revolution of the 60s was theological. Theology is the queen of the science. Everything else is nothing compared to theology. But with the American Civil War, theology was put off to the side, not even inquired of. But that doesn't mean that the theology is still not the queen of the sciences. It still is. Um, here's what Ratzinger uh, wrote about Teilhard. It must be regarded as an important service of Teilhard de Chardin's 
that he rethought these ideas from the angle of the modern view of the world and in spite of a not entirely unobjectable unobject tendency toward the biological approach, nevertheless, on the whole, grasped them correctly and in any case made them accessible once again. Let us listen to his own words. The human monad can only be absolutely itself by ceasing to be alone. In the background is the idea that in the cosmos, alongside the two orders or classes of the infinitely small and the infinitely big, there is a third order which determines the real drift of evolution, namely the order of the infinite complex, infinitely complex. It is the real goal of the ascending process of growth or becoming. It reaches a first peak in the genesis of living things and goes on. Um, he, uh, this guy writes here, again, the Orthodox Catholic must pause here and ask what similarity this language has with the teaching of the gospel. We are clearly lost in the gibberish of modernism, which by the 1960s had seduced some of the leading theologians in the church, including the future Supreme Pontiff, Benedict, who has never recanted his early support for Teilhard. In fact, his 2000 book, Spirit of the Liturgy, cited Teilhard in support of understanding, quote, Christ as the energy that strives toward the new, new sphere and finally incorporates everything in its fullness. Then he quotes Pius uh, the 11th, saying, Communism came out of evolution. Part four is the solemn enthronement of, of evolution. Um, what happens, I think, what you have here is nominalism. In other words, be emphasizing becoming over being. That's what they said was the main problem. Evolution, if you can go from species to species, then there's no, set, there's no solid substance or being. Everything's just becoming, coming whatever. Um, craziness. Then he quotes um, Ratzinger again. Um, and then the guy writes, after, after quoting Ratzinger, this represents a retreat into a sort of Kantian worldview. Some substance is unknowable. All that is knowable is our perception of things. This explains Ratzinger's discomfort with the traditional doctrine of creation, which he describes as a difficulty and a problem. Ratzinger explains in his 1969 book, Faith in the Future. Now, like I said, my textbook, which was pure evolution, taught by Father Murphy, a class that I had to take, I, I couldn't get out of it. Ratzinger writes his in 1969. My textbook was 1969. These things are hitting and hitting hard. And at 18, and even the smartest people couldn't figure out what was hitting them. Because they didn't know the answer was faith. They just want the truth. And if the truth is we came from a monkey, I guess that's the truth. Well, what's that do with Adam and Eve? What's that do with the, the church's traditional position on Adam and Eve? Well, the church's position is wrong. And what does everybody conclude? Well, Jesus and the apostles were wrong. They, just, they hadn't kept up with the science. They, that's officially what people say. Talk to them. Now, once they get caught, they're going to change their story. You know, it's like people that promoted the vaccine like crazy. Well, once you get caught on the vaccine, they're going to deny they promoted it. Of course they will. Ratzinger writes in his book, Faith in the Future. This explains his position on creationism. The difficulty begins with the very first page of the Bible. The concept presented there of how the world came to be is in direct contradiction of all that we know today about the origins of the universe. And the, and the problem continues almost page by page. In the very next chapter, new problems emerge with the story of the fall. How can one bring this into harmony with the knowledge that, on the evidence of natural science, man starts not from above but from a below, does not fall but slowly rises, even now having only just accomplished the metamorphosis from animal to human being? And what of paradise? Long before man existed, pain and death were in the world. Thistles and thorns grew long before any man had set eyes on them. And another thing, the first man was scarcely self-conscious, knew only privation and the weariness of struggle to survive. He was far from possessing the full endowment of reason, which the old doctrine of paradise attributes to him. But once the picture of paradise in the fall has been broken in pieces, the notion of original sins goes with it. To be followed logically, it would seem by the notion of redemption as well. So, so um, he writes here, 
Ratzinger is ironically spot on in his assertion that evolution is problematic to the concept of original sin. How could man have fallen from above if evolution teaches that he emerged from below? Unfortunately, Ratzinger does not draw the logical conclusion that, ergo, evolution is contrary to the Catholic faith. Instead, he adopts the radically new concepts of substance, original sin, and the special creation of man in order to retain his commitment to evolution. He totally twists all these concepts and makes them something different, which, which a Catholic is not supposed to do. For example, Further on in his book, Faith in the Future, we see that Ratzinger denies the traditional understanding of transubstantiation, that medieval dogma, because his evolutionary thought has caused him to deny the reality of substance. So, so he's even going at the core of the most precious um, doctrine of the Catholic Church normally is the Eucharist. He's going right at it. Um, he writes... Um, from his Thielhardian idea, Ratzinger will build up his conclusion that spirit can, in a sense, evolve from matter. Since the developments we witness in the unfolding of the cosmos should not be seen as unguided evolution, but as the self-actuation in time of a timeless logos. He uses the word logos all the time. Like a, like, like a kernel, and then the kernel goes into an oak tree, and he, he just kind of sees these things as evolving. But it's a complete denial of the, tr the church's traditional position on, uh, on, on creation. Um, he says, um, how, did the first man, how did the first man get here? He, well, he quotes it with his speech. Um, Can this vision of God which our first parents enjoyed prior to original sin, where you have a, a fully, uh, Adam created fully perfect and fully wise and, uh, you know, the closest person ever to God. He's, Adam is called the Son of God. He's created in the image and glory of God. He's, no one will ever get close to the fullness of what Adam was before the fall. So he writes, Can this vision of God which our first parents enjoyed prior to original sin be reconciled with Ratzinger's comments that the first conception of God emerged in the human species dimly and stammering, stammeringly? In other words, when did man get his soul? When he first reached out to God with, with some kind of words. That's when he first became a soul, according to Ratzinger. Uh, as we see, Ratzinger and those of his theological school have adopted the evolutionary thoughts of Thiel, Thielhard and the modernists with all its horrific implications. The abandonment of substance being, the special creation of man, the abandonment of that, Abandonment of original justice and original sin. Teilhard's rehabilitation by Ratzinger ushered in a period of enthusiastic acceptance of evolution by the universal church, which happily ignored both the conditions laid down by Pius XII and Humani Generis, as well as the theological objections from the pontificate of Leo XIII and the statements of Vatican I and Cologne. Um, and then he quotes all these people that are praising Deschardins. He quotes Cardinal Augustino Casaroli in 1981. They even quoted Cardinal Avery Dulles that we talked about in 2004. Dulles says this, in his own poetic style, the French Jesuit Teilhard de Chardin liked to meditate on the Eucharist as the first fruits of the new creation. Um, Although it would be probably incorrect to imagine that the university will eventually be transubstantiated, Teilhard correctly identified the connection between the Eucharist and the final glorification of the cosmos. Now, Cardinal Christoph Schoenberg, supposed to be conservative, says, The fascination which Teilhard de Chardin exercised for an entire generation stemmed from his radical manner of looking at science and Christian faith together. He praised de Chardin. Pope Benedict, 2009, said of Chardin, it's the great vision that later Teilhard de Chardin also had. At the end, we will have a true cosmic liturgy where the cosmos becomes a living host. Let us pray to the Lord that he will help us be priests in this sense, to help in the transformation of the world in adoration of God beginning with ourselves. Okay. Um, he closes here. 
Essentially, what we have witnessed is nothing other than the enthronement of evolution as a viable explanation for the origin of humanity. Although the last official pronouncement on the matter remains Pius XII's humani generis, few Catholic theologians today are willing to admit the existence of a literal Adam and Eve, and most have not worked out how this can work with the Church's doctrine of original sin. Okay. Closes by saying the Catholic Church cannot change its teaching when that teaching has been definitively proposed to the, for the faithful. However, in the question of evolution and its theological import, we have seen something very close to a revolution in the past generation, a revolution in support of a theory which Pope Pius X predicted would be the wreck of all religion. So it has consequences. Um, a fellow named McFadden, uh, Hugh Owens, Robert Sungenis, they point out, um, especially McFadden wrote books on it, he's in his 80s, that the main reason there's an exodus out of the Catholic Church is that they've been teaching theistic evolution in all their schools since Vatican II. And they, they have to make a choice. Is science true? Or are these stories in Genesis true? Some will just put it under the rug. Some will say, well, I think they go together, which is what the church tries to convince them. Or, what, or they'll go, well, it's one or the other. And if they reject science and go with the Bible, then they've got to be six-day creationists, which have been thoroughly demonized as radical fundamentalists. So this puts people like that Marion High School right here locally, they're froze up. They don't know what to teach. And the students walk away empty, no answers. But you can get an answer if you seek for the truth. If you seek the Lord and you seek truth, he will answer and he will give you wisdom. So we pray you get the wisdom on this matter. This is Peter Helland on the show Citizens for Community Media.